Thank you. Thanks, Diana. So well, our one panelist who's here, um, yeah, we're going to talk about Elizabeth when she shows up, though. And she works at the Post. No excuse. No excuse. Um, so our first panelist is Nancy Forsman. Nancy, come on up here. Nancy's a filmmaker. The uh, Roll Red Road is her first feature debut film. See, I memorized this. Um, and it examined the boys will be boys culture, <laughs> which you guys all know what that means, in Steubenville, Ohio of all places, right? Um, which involves the rape of an underage girl um, by two high school boys, one or two. I know there were two involved, but we can talk about that. Um, that went viral, and thus, because it went viral, it went international. Um, so, um, welcome to Nancy. <laughs> this is so conducive to wearing a dress <laughs> sitting here. Okay, I'll do the best I can. Uh, okay. <laughs> So as you guys know, um, the recent Senate hearings involving now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh and his accuser, Christine Blasey Ford, and I feel like I'm turning my back to you guys, so I'm going to try to be really mindful of that, captured the nation's attention over the last few weeks with Professor Ford's recollections of sexual assault in high school reigniting painful memories for countless women across the country. And it's a universe that you and Elizabeth both delved into. Adolescence, alcohol, sexual pressure, and assault. So, what stuck out in your mind with your experiences um, in Ohio as the revelations involving Dr. Ford and uh, Justice Kavanaugh or Judge Kavanaugh unfolded? Yeah, um, we um, thanks so much for the introduction. It's really great to be here. Um, we, you know, the opening of the film, which I hope you guys can come see tonight at 8.30, um, it starts out with the laughter of boys. Um, and I knew when I had that material, I knew that's how I wanted the film to start um, because it's so shocking. It's not graphic, it's not visually graphic, but the, the laughter, right? And then you have Dr. Ford, who's a scientist, neuroscientist, saying, you know, indelible in my hippocampus was the sound of the boys' laughter. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. Um, so it really felt like her testimony and the description of Kavanaugh, I'm not going to call him, what I, you know, he'll get a last name, Kavanaugh and Judge, um, you know, their behavior, it just seemed to be ripped almost from the Steubenville story. So we actually published an op-ed last week um, really just placing, you know, the description of the event um, of Dr. Ford's recollection and then the description of what happened in Steubenville and they're just mirrors for each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's funny to think about when we got to look at Kavanaugh's um, yearbook scribblings, you know, all those jokes, I don't know if you all know, like, you know, oh, I'm You mean the calendar that he kept for 36 years? And I want to ask, like, who keeps a calendar for 36 years? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone saw the SNL with the <laughs> Oh, Damon Oh, Matt calendar. Damon, yeah. Um, Priceless. No, but all of their friends um, had these uh, inside jokes in their yearbooks, um, basically slut shaming one of their fellow students. And Roll Red Roll uses a lot of social media where they pull kind of jokes and shaming language and they just put it on the internet. And when I saw what Kavanaugh had put in his really fancy private school yearbook, it looked exactly like the stuff the kids in Ohio were doing. Just the medium's different. You know, in this case, it's your book, print, and, you know, Roll Red Roll's case, it's social media, mm -hmm. it's Twitter. Mm -hmm. But it's the same behavior. Mm -hmm. Is that typical? Is that, because we want to talk about, like, high school stuff and how this, this sort of high school is often an incubator for this type of thing. Is that typical? Um, you know, what you saw, the similarities, is that more often than not how it starts? Well, I know that... Um, are we going to be able to, sorry, one second. Are we going to be able to show the trailer, maybe? Yeah, I mean, should we do that now? And that, Well, I'll, I'll answer yeah, the question. It's your, tra it's your film, but uh -huh. yeah, we, we can. I mean, we could certainly show a, yeah. a clip um, because I love, the, I love actually the way it was shot. Uh-huh. So. Oh, great. Um, maybe we'll roll the trailer of the film, and then we can talk a little bit about high school culture. Is that okay? Roll Red Roll is going to roll. Yeah. <laughs> 
under pressure to get these kids guilty. And even if they're guilty of way that they didn't do this and that, I hope, you know, that the truth comes out. When I first read this story, there wasn't a lot of substance to the article. Two high school football players had been charged just a couple of paragraphs about these two boys and that was it. I thought, this is nuts because that town is so entrenched in their football team. This is big news. So that's when I started snooping around. I had never seen a case constructed like this. That many people who have some information. This was a sexual assault with teenagers, and the cell phones told the story. We had photos. We had 400,000 text messages. It was on Twitter, actually. Song of the Night raped me. Some people deserve to be peed on. Just the complete lack of empathy, that was what was so frightening. I mean, it was all out there. You're always gonna get two very different sides, but this was just at another level. We didn't know exactly what happened, but we knew there was a lot of defensiveness about this. Uh, I just didn't understand it at all, I, because I don't think it's something that doesn't occur in other cities and states and counties all over. If teachers knew about it, if coaches knew about it, if a principal knew about it, if parents knew about it, why was nothing done about that? And the question was, is this football town, you know, putting its daughters at risk by protecting its sons in a situation like this? The blogger, Alex, if it weren't for Alex, would this have ever come out? I don't think so. Um, and Some special treat tonight, Alex Goddard and Rachel DeSell, um, an investigative reporter from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and Alex are going to be here at the screening. So it's really awesome to have them both there. Alex, um, no. I, I think in 2012, um, you know, there were... It was the beginning of social media, and kids didn't quite realize how public it was, but it, it was things were starting to go viral. Um, but I know because I'm connected to a lot of sort of online feminists and women who have been reporting about the digital space, that when they would get you know harassing tweets threatening their lives and they would go to the police about it, the police would be like, "Who cares? It's, it's Twitter. Like why is that a threat?" And I feel like now we have a much deeper understanding of online harassment and its links to offline harassment, but um, in 2012, it was just like this new world, and what's so great about Alex Goddard is she's, you know, we call her like a sofa sleuth. You know, she really knows how to dig around, she knows how to find deleted information, she knows what's legal and what isn't, and she had the foresight looking to say, wow, like, look how these kids are talking about this. It might not be criminal, but it's certainly indicative of a much larger cultural problem. So tell yeah. us how she stumbled across this, or did she stumble across it? Did someone call her? Did she, how did she, I mean, you, you could be on the internet all day and not stumble across mm -hmm. something like this. Mm -hmm. So how did, how did that all start? Yeah, um, Alex lived in Steubenville for several years, and she had family ties back there. Um, so she would, you know, check in on the local news. And what stood out to her was, wait a minute, the local news is very pro Steubenville, pro football. Um, so the fact that they were even covering this rape and then she noticed that the comment section was closed and she's like what okay so there's an arrest of two players which is a big deal in this town something something definitely happened if these boys were arrested and no one can leave a comment about it so she called the police so she's so smart you know she started looking up the kids looking nosy up. she's nosy she's a nosy just girl yeah like she will she will be the first to say it she likes to stir the pot um, and she saw all the tweets, gathered them, screen capped them, and then went to the cops and said, look, um, you know, I have this information, is this of use to you? 
And a few days went by, a few days went by, and she didn't hear anything. And she was so incensed that adults were like victim blaming the girl and everyone's trying to minimize this thing. And she said, you know what, I have stuff and I'm gonna show you what it looks like. And I'm gonna open the comment section on my blog so people in town can talk. And that's what she did. And, and I was going to get to victim blaming a little later, but I remember there was a, a radio host who was really, I mean, when you guys see the film, you'll see, you know, like, it's sort of like, oh, well, she, um, it's easier to, it's, it's easier to say you've been raped than to go home and tell your parents you got drunk and had sex. Who says that? Um, so like who keeps the calendar. Um, so that goes back to my high school question. So why is high school sort of this incubator for a lot of the sexual misconduct and sexual assaults? Um, well, that's like a really, that's a, a big question that I'm not sure I'm like fully equipped to answer, but I would say primarily because the United States doesn't teach respect and consent-based sexual education to its young people. Um, the CDC uh, Center for Disease Control released a report that one in three teenagers will experience violence in a relationship. So that's huge, right? So there's nothing countering um, a really disastrous lack of information. Um, under George W. Bush, we had eight years of abstinence-only sex ed. Did anyone have to suffer through that schooling? Um, basically, it's like, you know, if you get you know, I went to Catholic school, sex. the nuns weren't having it. So. <laughs> you know, sex will kill you with a disease, and if you get pregnant, you're a whore, basically. Um, good morning, everyone, sorry. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, essentially <laughs> that, you know, so there's just a horrible lack of information. All, all the kinds of blame were put on girls and women, hypersexualized culture, um, and really, actually, not just hypersexualized, actually, a rape culture that, you know, is just entrenched that women, you know, the first film that I made in 2009, um, this NFL quarterback who works with young men, Don McPherson, said something great, which is, you know, we raise, we raise women to survive in a rape culture, and we do nothing to talk to men about not raping. And that hasn't changed. You know, I made that film, Fledgling Fund supported our outreach, um, really early times when people weren't talking about consent. And and it's like 10 years later, and that hasn't really changed, right? So um, I think that kids don't have a good sense of their bodily autonomy, especially young girls. Girls are taught to be nice. Boys are taught to go take and get. You know, you're a stud. If you have a lot of partners, if you're a girl, that's certainly not how it works. So it's just a hotbed. And then you get to college, and you have no parents. And it's just like off the charts. That's why there's such a huge assault problem in college, too. That's interesting you say that because there was um, a story online last night on the post about a teacher, and I forgot somebody, if, the, if you guys know, let me know. I've forgotten what um, state, but she's a third grade teacher, and she started teaching consent in her class and that no means no and she had the third graders like draw stick figures of like some some guy holding out his arm saying can I hug you and and the girl's like no you know and 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 he asked you know the girl with the flip hair right and he asked again and she's like no exclamation point and so she's actually teaching it at third but should you have to teach it in third grade I, I mean that's so. you know like has it come to that where well, it's not, it's not even that. I mean, just when you look at children, um, because I'd been looking at sex ed and how sex ed is taught in different countries, um, in uh, Indonesia and Holland and other places. Hello. Hi. You must be Elizabeth. Hi. That's okay. So sorry. Okay. We'll, we'll chime in. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Finish so, well, in terms of sexual education, because I had done some studies on it. Um, so, Indonesia, there were villages, and Indonesia is a Muslim country. So, you have a rural Muslim context, and there was someone who was hurting the children, right? And they did this thing where they said, okay, well, we have to teach our kids the names of their body parts so they even know how to tell their mom and dad that something's happening, right? Mm -hmm. And I know in Hasidic um, Jewish community, they don't teach the children that stuff. And there's a lot of shame around it. You don't ask. And there's a lot of abuse because kids can't articulate what's going on. So in terms of consent, it's also just about like, this is your body. You're a child. You have the right to say no. Don't make me kiss that uncle that I don't want to kiss. And 
boys should know and girls too, you don't have the right to touch someone's body. You know, I think it's actually a, a lot of other cultures that do that and I think it's just part of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were talking, Elizabeth, just to bring you up to speed on uh, consent and how um, someone at the Post did a story um, that ran online, I think it was last night, it was posted about a third grade teacher um, teaching consent in her class and how you have the right to say no if somebody wants to hug you or you know touch you or do anything else. So you've been brought up to speed, okay? Um, so um, I had asked I had asked Nancy earlier like what stuck out in her mind in terms of um, her experiences in Ohio and Steubenville as the revelations involving uh, Judge Kavanaugh and Professor Ford. Um, Unfolded. So I will ask you the same thing in Arlington, Texas. Was it Arlington or North Arlington? Arlington, Texas. Arlington, Texas. Um, when you went back to your high school where a young woman had been raped and she was a senior and you were a freshman at the time. She was a junior and a I was junior. a sophomore at the you time. Were so okay, well, somebody got it wrong, Diana. Uh, <laughs> she later became a senior. Yeah, so that makes sense. Y'all were in high school together. We were. Okay. Um, and so what stuck out in your mind? Uh, the expectation uh, that anybody would have sort of perfect recollection, uh, especially if they had been extremely drunk and uh, at a party where there was drinking going on, um, seemed immediately strange to me. So I knew how much work we had had to do in the story um, with taking down, her name is Amber, her account of events. And then, um, you know, we sort of meticulously reconstructed the night down to the minute. Um, we did with with other kids and interviews the police had done contemporaneously um, and and pieced together the uh, the account uh, corroboration uh, as best we could what emerged uh, was that you know of course there were some gaps um, in, in Amber's memory uh, especially of the rape itself um, which is partially because she was very inebriated partially because of trauma um, and at the time, the police hadn't found them to be an issue. They, they thought that was pretty typical, and they expected uh, that uh, from a victim her age and in the condition she had been in at the time. Um, so when people started saying, well, if this happened, she would have perfect recall of how she got there, uh, you know, who, where the house was specifically, I can certainly, uh, it, it, it isn't dispositive if someone does have perfect recollection um, but I knew just from reading the police notes and interviewing the detectives, that's pretty rare uh, in cases like these. Mm -hmm. and, and to recap, um, so you went back to your high school, you did a multi-part series for The Post about this rape, and this involved a, a young woman who was really like hounded out of school um, because she, she, like your victim in Steubenville, um, filed police reports, and so it, she was ostracized, but then later, people, years later, people realized, oh, they may have made a mistake about right. When this story came out in, in Arlington, Texas, uh, both Amber and I received sort of flood of emails from people who had been at our high school. One, one thing that's notable about Arlington, Texas is not a small town. It's a huge city between Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, and so this was a school with 4,000 kids. My high school was bigger than my college. I went to Brandeis. Um, so there were tons and tons of people there. And she started receiving emails, and so did I, from people who said, I remember this. I was around at the time. I saw the graffiti about her on the school. I heard the rumors, and I um, figured there was nothing I could do about it, or it was none of my business, or she was just a liar. That's what I was told. And um, and they apologized to her, and they apologized to me. Actually, a captain of the football team um, wrote to Amber to apologize. Um, and, and there were a lot of incidents like that. And for Amber, um, that's been helpful, and it's been meaningful. Um, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's a part of her for which it's too little too late. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to what um, one of your characters was saying in, in your doc, that you know, either protect the boys at the expense of the girls. And so nobody believed her then. Well, some people did. I mean, her parents, her family. But basically, she was, you know, ostracized. Well, there are a lot of similarities between Steubenville yeah. and, and what happened mm -hmm. here, which is mm -hmm. disturbing. I was reading her piece, and it was so upsetting. Um, so upsetting. Like, um, But at Friday Night Lights, I used to say, roll red roll is the dark side of Friday Night Lights. Yes. That's it. You know, and, and there is that thing. And 
you know, I'm not a football gal myself, but, you know, Pledge of Allegiance and the whole town is in the stadium and the flag is flapping in the background and it's this like moment and it does have some of those FNL qualities and then there's just this complete underbelly of disrespect and violence and um, and I think what's interesting, you know, we talked about Kavanaugh, yearbook scrawling, slut shaming, roll red roll. Calendars. Calendars. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was more for his appointments, but... Um, and you know, roll red roll is all the social media, and in and in, in your story, they're doing it on cars. But it's right. the same behavior. It's exactly. Right. It's just the medium's different. This was a little bit earlier than the, you know. Twitter wasn't as it was two thousand six. So we you know some of the social media hadn't caught up. It was really big on MySpace. But MySpace is how the kids all coordinated to write faith on the backs of their mm -hmm. cars, and that was an acronym that stood for, for derogatory. Yeah, it was really something amber in the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so. There are countless sexual assaults in this country every day. I mean, every day. So, Nancy, why did you choose to go to this very Midwestern, and I'm a Midwesterner, I'm from Chicago, so I can say that, working class town of 18,000 people um, that, that to, to, to look at this incident that played out on social media via text messages, via photos of the actual um, incident, it was just, why, why, why did you choose that? And also, by the time you and others got there, it had been covered um, by the mainstream media and had become, thanks to Alec, the blogger, an um, uh, uh, international story. Yeah, well, they were so excited that I came, um, as you can imagine. Uh, hi, guys. What's football? No, um, but, uh, well, what interested me really and truly about the story, I had been researching, um, I, I had wanted to look at the behavior of perpetrators and bystanders. So I am so happy we're in this moment where these conversations are happening in so many contexts about sexual assault and about Me Too. But for a long time, I felt like the burden has been on women and survivors to offer up their stories and beg for people to believe us, right? And I think the media is doing a great job but also feasting on victim stories. And for me, the progress and the change is really about men and boys. Like women, we, we live this. We went to high school. We've had to fight men off of us. We've you know, had our friends tell us their stories. Like we know this stuff and there's, there's obviously things to learn. But deeply, deeply, for me, what I felt strongly about five years ago is we have to shift the lens off of girls and women's behavior, women's clothing. Why are we not looking at who is doing this, how they're planning it, how they're coordinating it, how things are premeditated? Yours was premeditated, too. And premeditated isn't this mastermind, criminal, beautiful mind plan, right? And Steubenville was premeditated because they're like, yeah, we're going to train her. Okay, we're getting her here. We're going to bring her here. We're going to bring her there. We're going to do it there, and we're going to do it there. And they talked about it in advance. So for me, I, I wanted to look at uh, men or young men who are willing to talk openly about raping. <laughs> uh, that's hard to find. Um, Is that why you didn't name her? She, oh, she was a Jane Doe throughout the whole absolutely. film. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, I was like, this is not this is not going to be a story that's focusing on her. We are going to shift completely. And I was able to do that because of the archive of social media. And when we were, um, you know, when you see the film, we also were, were given 400,000 text messages among all the, the boys. And you could see how they're talking about it before, how they're talking about it after, how they're bragging about it with each other. And there, there were at least 20 kids who knew about it. So... I wanted in the voices of men who've admitted to or thought about, that's what I was looking to explore. And that was, I didn't want to go into the prison system and talk to men who were repeat, repeat offenders. I thought it'd be more interesting to find someone younger because maybe there's a chance to shift and change it. Um, and Steubenville just provided the opportunity um, because everything was so public. Yeah. And your film was based on a lot of documents and videos and police interrogations. I'm still amazed that um, the people who were interviewed by police uh, as a former police reporter, like, where were their parents? Like, the cops just, one of them took a swab, like a DNA swab from them. Like, no lawyers, no parents. Yeah, they have, um, what is it called? It's sort of a bystander law in Ohio. Um, Two people sought representation 
and many, many didn't. There were about seven people that they wanted to talk to, mm -hmm. and I guess they were advised, you know, participate. You didn't do anything wrong, but I know that the attorney general had some leverage because if you witness a crime in Ohio, there's an obligation to intervene, and that not every state has these laws, so the attorney general was able to sort of use that um, intervention tool and get them to, to be cooperative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How difficult was it for you to piece this together? I mean, because it was based heavily on, on the documents, on the videos, on the, the interrogations, the interviews with the, the uh, residents. Um, how, how tough was that to get people, you know, they lived it, they relived it through, you know, the local paper, then they relived it again through the national media, now here you come along again. Was it easier for them this time, or was it, or was it as tough um, as it was the first time? Well, I'd love to compare notes with you at some point um, on piecing together the night. Um, we had a lot, it, I think the, the biggest challenge was sifting through rumor, and there was so many rumors, and every, once you start talking to folks, like, oh, well, you know about this person, and this person, and this happened, and, you know, at first when we cut together a sizzle, my producer, Stephen Lake, and I were, like, yanking things off the internet, and, like, only later we learned, like, you can't put that, <laughs> hi, lesson, yeah. It looks good online, but you can't put it in your movie. You know, so we're, we, we learned that hard um, of like. File a FOIA. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, in terms of piecing together what happened, once we got the, um, the files from the prosecution, it was like, oh my God, now we can look and see the locations and the time stamping and comparing it to three different boys' testimonies in court and then comparing it to the tweets. Like then you can be kind of artful because they're saying one thing on the witness stand and then they're saying something else to their buddies on Twitter, you know, which was really um, interesting. So, so that whole investigation piece was like all good films are made with spreadsheets, I'm sure. Um, it's just like Excel spreadsheet, timestamp, timestamp, timestamp. Um, and that was really fun. And it felt like, it's just like, oh my God, it's so satisfying because some things are so concrete and then some things are just totally not. And we're never gonna know because of memory gaps and because of that kind of thing. And then in terms of speaking with the town, I just felt when we talk about justice and sort of restorative justice, like how do we repair harm in a community? Like so many people are harmed when this happens. So that was my approach with the town was just sort of like, this is hard for everyone. And there's a lot of victim blaming in the film, but that's also just sort of like where a man in his 60s is at in his understanding of gender dynamics. You know, there's something just, yeah. Okay. Elizabeth, you and Amber Wyatt, the victim um, in Texas, you guys were a great apart. Did you know each other? No, I was uh, a loser. She was a cheerleader. <laughs> 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 I was on the debate team. Uh, I was on the debate team in yeah, college. In Usually I have a comeback. I have no comeback for it. I was a, <laughs> I was a loser. I mean, I don't know what you say behind that. Was no, you were optimistic. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we didn't know each other. Um, the guy who would later become my husband was a football player at, at my high school at the time. He ended up quitting football to do debate because they were both on Friday nights. So he was a loser too? <laughs> he uh, transitioned. <laughs> <laughs> Into loserdom, um, but so the the cliques were very separated, right? I mean, so there were kids who, uh, for instance, are, there were too many kids in our school to eat in the lunchroom, so kids just ate all over the school at lunchtime. You could eat wherever you wanted. You could sit in the classroom. Mostly, we sat in hallways, um, and so the the kids who kind of worried about their grades a lot and did a lot of academic competitions, debate. Uh, UIL, Texas thing, University Interscholastic League, Academic Quiz League, Academic Decathlon. I was in all of those. I, uh, we sat Damn, in one you place were a loser. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, but look at you now. So part Paid of writing, off. <laughs> part, of, uh, part of writing this story was like coming to terms with that. And, um, and uh, you know, no one probably wants to look back at their high school years with like a microscopic lens. Where was I? How did I see this? What was I doing? Um, but I actually ended up getting my old class schedule and figuring out how it was. I saw the graffiti, what time of day, um, and ended up interviewing our old principal, our old superintendent, uh, all of these, all of these people who I thought I would never speak to again. 
Why this case? Was it something that you remember kids talking about then? Um, did it haunt you all these years? I mean, it's not all these years. You've only been out of high school, like, what, 12 years or something? Um, 13, maybe. Um, so it wasn't, like, you know, decades ago. What was it about this young woman um, and the way that she was uh, treated that made you want to go back and tell her story? So when I left Texas, I thought that I would never miss it. I hated high school. Uh, this was part of it. It was just a very, it was just, it was rough. I mean, you know, one of the main jokes in school was a gang rape, and, you know, and then that's, uh, that's the, that's a, that's like the going humor. So I was, thought to myself, I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm going to college, and I won't be back. Um, but actually, I missed it quite a bit. I missed Texas, and I had to come to terms with how much I really loved it. And it occurred to me in that time period, um, which was college and grad school, um, that every, every stranger in the world can be friendly to you and like you, and it will still hurt that your own hometown didn't. And so Amber, who had been a big subject of discussion and, and jokes and mockery and, and remained that way even after she graduated, um, I would think about her and think, you know, however she's doing now, I always assumed she was doing well. I think I, that was hopeful, and she is doing well. Um, but I thought it, it must still be a matter of unfinished business that the people she needed and the people who relied on, you know, who she relied on, who were her closest peers, uh, who were her hometown, that they weren't there, that they were, in fact, a sort of malicious uh, to her. And, uh, and that that stuck with me a lot. I thought about that a lot. It did haunt me. And, and when I got back in touch with her, it was important to her. And it ended up being sort of helpful in the story that I was not just a person, right? I was, I was there. I was a peer. I was from that school, that town, that place, and that time. And you were a person who didn't judge her at the time. I didn't know what to think. Um, I, the, the going rumor had been that she recanted. The, the everyone said, uh, oh yeah, this girl said she was gang raped by a couple of athletes, but then she took it all back. She probably just made it up for attention. And that was the complete story which was, which was passed around. When I got into the police files, uh, for when I spoke to Amber and asked her if she'd ever recanted, Amber had never recanted to anyone at any time. Um, and when I looked at the police files and police interviews, it was actually um, an adult, it was the mother of a cheerleader who told the police Amber had recanted. She said it was secondhand. She heard Amber had recanted talking to another girl. I called the other girl. The other girl said, no, never. She never recanted. I never said that. Um, but that's how the police began to hear uh, that she was going around town saying it never happened, was from this grown woman who had been giving kids alcohol at her house and was trying to avoid prosecution. Oh, the that. mom, that's right. Yeah, the, the mom. mom. Yeah. yeah. And Amber had later had some substance abuse issues. Yeah, severe. What yeah. role did that, do you think, the uh, sexual assault played? See, Amber feels like it played a huge role. And in a lot of her recovery material from before we got in touch, she had talked about how her sexual assault had been a huge factor. and. Um, developing uh, addiction. One of the things that was weird about Amber's story was that at the time it happened, uh, the boys were sort of made to look like victims. Uh, the, the position of the city was sort of oh, you know, this, this slutty girl who's making accusations because she wants attention or because she's hostile to these guys and, and we have faith that they're going to overcome it and they'll be okay. Um, if you, but when I actually got closer and looked back, Amber already had some substance abuse issues. This was well known to everyone. Um, she was already in a vulnerable position and then was just further and further victimized. Uh, and, and that was disturbing to me. Mm -hmm. That also, I, I think, in our case, sort of speaks to, um, you know, a premeditation, right? So. Um, Jane Doe in, wasn't actually from Steubenville. She's from the town across the river. Um, and, and had a really good family support. And actually that river was really helpful in her community backing her and Steubenville's over there. But they knew the boys. She's not from the school, right? So she goes to these, you know, Steubenville, those are the cool guys. And, and so she goes to these parties and one of the girl in the police interview is like, I kind of knew her, but none of us knew her. 
Right, so they plan that, right? So they take her to a party, and she's trusting one of the guys who's the lead ringleader and assa assaulting her. Um, they take her to a place where no one's gonna stick up for her. And then they move her party to party. And one girl at the beginning is like, I mean, I kind of know her, she's not a good friend, and I was trying to help her, but she's like not my really good friend, so I'm not gonna like yank her away, right? I did a bit, maybe I didn't do enough. And she's the only person to show remorse about not doing enough, no one else does, right? But that was on purpose, you know? Because if she was surrounded by her friends, maybe this wouldn't have happened. And in Amber's case, if they know someone's teetering on the edge or able to get pushed, I mean, they, you, they choose. Our working title for Amber's story was Easy Prey. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's kind of what we called it internally while we were working on it. Um, it it's absolutely the case that she was well known as someone uh, who had some substance abuse issues, who was frequently unable to defend herself or really navigate her surroundings. And at the point where this all happened, the mother the mom, this 50-year-old, uh, had determined Amber was so drunk, she just wanted her gone from this party. Uh, and so, for whatever reason, she asked these two senior boys to take her home. And so, everyone- Instead of her driving her home. Instead of the mother the driving, driving her home, home, or calling Amber's parents, uh, or anything like that, this, uh, this cheerleading mom told these two senior boys, take her home. They took her to a shed instead off a back road behind a friend's property that they knew about. Um, but uh, there was no disagreement among anyone who had seen her that she was walking unsteadily, that sh her speech was very slurred. I mean, an adult, a 50-year-old woman had determined this herself. Um, so it, it was clear that she was picked. Well, that's eerily similar to the story in the film where the girl is so drunk and the mom is letting kids drink in the house or just like, okay, whoever's not sleeping over, Jane Doe gets sick, everyone get out. Jane Doe is carried out of that house. And that's the photo that went viral. Mm -hmm. um, she's carried by two boys, like, like she's completely passed out. My mother would never let anyone leave the house like that. So a parent- My mother wouldn't have allowed drinking in yeah. the house. Or, I'm just saying my parents weren't having it. Or even if you had alcohol. Yeah, there was no booze in their basement. But like the fact that there were all these kids in the front yard saying stuff about her, like the parents are like, okay, just get out. We don't want to be responsible. Right. They did not get her home safely. Right. Those two boys no, raped they, her. These two guys uh, <laughs> took her to a shed uh, and then they brought her back to the party because they. Um, one thing that you, you sort of realize when you're reporting on crime is most people are not criminal masterminds. There's like a select few Hannibal Lecters in the world and everyone well, that's else why is they always get caught. kind of a bumbling idiot. Um, <laughs> and so they bring her back to the party. The mother, a Amber, immediately says she was raped right there in the driveway as soon as she's out of their truck. Um, the mother turns to the boys and says, what happened? They go, we didn't have sex. We didn't have sex. There's semen in her body that the police then recover the next day in a, in a rape kit. So their story wasn't that they had sex and it was consensual, it's that they never had sex, didn't touch her. Bad. And it's just bad lying. Um, but I mean, that, uh, that kind of set the tone for how cavalier everyone would be about it throughout the whole investigation. Um, sort of wondering, this is an afterthought, but were the parent, any of these adults charged with anything the cheerleaders mom the marco's mom was it marco his mom where the party happened were any of these parents charged with anything um, we had adults that were indicted in the studentville case they were from the school they're from the school yeah so the second party was not mark cole's house the second party the parents there was no alcohol at the house but the kids were kind of you know in between unaccompanied parties um, so one of the parents there got some, in some trouble, but no, there were no criminal. Mark Cole's mom was out of town, you know, so she left her 17-year-old with the keys and said, don't have a party, and that's Yeah, that happened. always works. <laughs> works. Yeah. In, in our case, uh, the police, we can see from their records, they discussed indicting Cindy Marks, who was the mom. Um, they talked about indicting her for something like assisting in the delinquency of a minor because it was at her house and she was like kind of partying with these kids, which is weird in its own right. Um, uh, my mom had no interest in hanging out with high school kids. Um, my parents didn't even want me in the house. Yeah, my parents, I mean, um, when I was talking to my mom and dad about this case, 
I was like, yeah, there were 30 kids uh, at, this, at this party. And mom's like, you didn't know that many people. I was like, yeah, I knew like five people. Um, the debate team. Um, but but the, 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 the end of the day, the police decided they couldn't prove that she was supplying the alcohol. The kids brought their own. And she was just kind of providing a setting where they could get completely wasted. Um, and so she, she wasn't indicted. She wasn't, she wasn't ever prosecuted for anything. The national attention, not only on the Steubenville case, but um, uh, also your going back to Texas um, and, and during the Kavanaugh hearings have allowed other women to come forward to tell their stories. Why does it take something like this um, for women to feel comfortable and accepted um, in terms of you know, telling their story? It's, it's, it takes some national incident. Oh, I mean, I think that um, Amber's first experience with reporting this was being disbelieved, harassed, eventually forced out of our school and into an alternative education campus, and then sort of spiraling into addiction. Um, she had no, she didn't come to me, I went to her. Um, she had sort of given up on ever telling anyone about it ever again. Um, and so I think for a lot of women, the first instance of reporting is very traumatic. <laughs> the first time they tell someone, they're either disbelieved or outright punished, as in Amber's case, for reporting it. What national incidents do is it lets women know there's someone who's willing to give you a fair hearing, who's not going to punish you for reporting what happened to you, and who's willing to give it a serious investigation. Um, and, and oftentimes, they've not even been given the benefit of that, of a fair hearing. Um, and just that, and, and just knowing there's someone who's willing to listen, who's not going to be openly abusive or judgmental about it, I think opens up a real space. Yeah, I guess, I guess you know, the flip side is it takes a national event, but I don't think women are ever comfortable coming forward. There's nothing that's gonna, and, and men, right? There's a lot, and, and trans folks, there's a lot of, especially men, there's so much shame. And I think the Catholic Church enabled a lot of boys who are now men to come forward and, and talk about that. But I just think that when you see what happens to Dr. Ford, when she does, and there's an outpouring of support, but there's mocking and shame and slut shaming and all of that stuff. So. Um, I think it inspires people to say, wow, I'm not alone. I didn't make it up. This is so common. I have not something crazy. to say. I'm yeah. not crazy. Um, but, you know, I just talked to a lot of folks who want to maybe make a film about their thing or, you know, I, the work I've wanted to do is more empower peers because the peer to peer, like when you first not even go to the police, I'm not going to go to the police. I don't encourage most of the time survivors to go to the police until the police clean up their act. New York City had cops who were raping women. Um, but, you know, I think if we can work, for me, what I've always wanted to do is work in the peer context so that when you go to your best friend, she doesn't say, oh, well, you shouldn't have gone with those guys. You know they're dicks. Or like, well, you always were kind of slutty. You know, because your friends can say things that are so awful, especially when you're younger. So if we can educate younger people about how to hold that kind of story, it does reduce the trauma um, for when you make your careful decision about what you want to do with what happened. So how do, how, do, how do we change that culture? So A, so that sexual assaults don't happen, uh, or B, when they do, that women know it's okay um, to, to talk about it. Well, I'm gonna plug my film now and um, our impact campaign. Uh, how and your app. Don't forget about my your app. app. Yes. Um, I also developed um, for the, I, I developed a mobile app called Circle of Six um, that Vice President Biden put a challenge out um, to reduce violence. Um, and it's really peer-to-peer -peer modeled. It's now going to be encrypted. We're using it with journalists in Mexico and Brazil as well. It's a safety tool that does not link you to the police and has embedded um, you safety plan before you go into the field or before... Okay, conflict journalists use it before they go into the field. 20-year-old girls use it before they go to a frat party. I mean, which is kind of horrifying. Like, it's the same structure, and it can be War used in the same... Party. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, thinking ahead of who are your people, who do you trust, who can you talk to, who can you text in an emergency. And it's also a shorthand in terms of um, I need to talk, and it's sent through Circle of Six, so it's clear about 
what. But I think, you know, I'm gonna kind of contradict myself. I think like the Me Too and the outpouring of stories does make it easier and better for women to find each other also in this moment. And, and women are not, <laughs> we're a lot less tolerant of the bullshit at this point. Um, the rape culture masqueraded as boys will be boys, right? So I think there is more space to challenge that. I think there's um, that kind of encouragement. But what we wanna do with the film is really work with coaches, athletic departments, male leaders and men who can model for younger men, like, hey, this is my issue. Like, women can't be the victim and be solving the problem. Like, we're done, that's a ton of emotional labor. Um, it's really about passing that baton to um, groups, bless you, that work with, with young people to say, this isn't just a women's problem, right? This is a cultural, community, education, societal problem, mm -hmm. and we all have a stake in making it better. I'd like to open it up for questions because we have a few minutes, about 10 minutes left. And so there's a hand that went up right over there. Or were you stretching? No, I have okay. a question. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, Testing. Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Hard subject to talk about, but the timing-wise is incredible. Obviously, you've, the journey on your films started up way before we got to today. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about was the fabric of the city, right? In in I think one of the things it's it's that culture that is perpetrated from a religious standpoint. You know the relationship and what men and women. I, I see that in terms of the evangelical movement endorsing what's going on right now in a religious thing in, in Texas. I know how that is really embedded. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, just one interesting thing about we started this film. I started this film like four, four and a half years ago, and I went into the library, which is always the best space in a small town, and I was looking through microfilm, and what's amazing is that every newspaper was talking about sexual assault even then because of what was happening in the military. There was just this like slow and steady drumbeat that I was like, oh my God, page two of the Weirton Times is talking about rape in the military. And page two, you know, it just was like happening. Like it was already building, um, which I just found to be really fascinating because you're like, wow, that hit this town by surprise. Not if you're looking at the paper every day. Because it was and the Catholic and Spotlight, which was here four years ago, what happened in the Catholic Church. Um, so Steubenville is a really Catholic town, um, really, really Catholic. They have um, a, a prominent school on the hill um, that's one of the most conservative Catholic uh, universities in the country. Um, and the other thing that was quite shocking, it's not just the church. Um, football has no women in leadership for the most part, and the Catholic Church has no women in leadership. So I would go to these city council meetings to talk to hear like civic people who are wanna improve the city, and it's like, well, there, there is not one woman on the city council, there's not one woman standing at the front of a church, and there's not one woman standing on the football field. And until the superintendent was indicted, he was a man, they, ha they finally got a superintendent of the school as a woman, but it's just like, wow, this is what happens when there are no women in leadership. So whether it's evangelical or Catholic or whatever, when, when you're shut out of making decisions and shut out of like, you know, expanding community, this is, this is who you protect, basically. And Elizabeth, you have a master's in religion, so. Yeah, I ended up getting my, um, my MPhil in Christian theology. Um, that's not a loser. That's very cool. I think that's still under the domain. Of I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to help you here. I really am. <laughs> it was a Marshall scholarship. I went to Cambridge. Um, uh, so, I mean, grades. Yeah, uh, grades. Um, uh, well, if you're good at something, do it. Um, in, in Texas, it was um, the biggest group, the biggest student club at the school was Seekers, which is an evangelical Christian organization to a kid. These kids were all involved with Seekers. In fact, that's why they, it seems to be why they use the acronym FAITH, um, because it wouldn't raise any eyebrows. They were whispering to each other about what it really meant, but when teachers saw it written on the backs of cars, they were like, oh, how nice, FAITH, yes, of course. Um, They're finally getting it. Right. Uh, right. 
And then, uh, and so what kind of surprised me as a pretty, uh, pretty, I mean, you know, committed Christian um, was how there's like a part of their life where they just turn that completely off. Um, and I would talk to people about that, knowing that these were, you know, largely evangelical people. And I would be, what do you think Jesus thinks about this? Just putting that on the table. What do you think Christ would think about what happened? Uh, your role in it? How do you feel about that? How does it, uh, how does it work for you? Um, which is something that I was curious about, but the, the, the revelation is right. There's just, there's a domain of life in, in some cultures where everything you do in the daylight, every other part of your life, uh, is completely shut off. And then there's this realm of total cynicism and, and weird predatory, uh, behavior that is not consonant at all with, with what you preach. Yes, there's a question over here. Hi. Uh, my question concerns um, philanthropy. I work uh, in philanthropy, and my organization represents media funders specifically. And I was at a meeting last week where um, Tarana Burke, the founder of Me Too, was saying that she didn't feel like philanthropy was as activated as it could be on this issue. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what funders can do um, to make more progress? And w maybe if you have any lessons or takeaways. Um, I guess it's how, how these funders want to define progress. Um, you know, is it about if they, well, you know, I'm going to come from a filmmaker standpoint. Um, and I think there's been a lot of change in terms of understanding the impact that films can have on hearts and minds, like the work I want to do is behavioral and cultural, and we need these like long-term campaigns and, and really strong content that can do that. So if funders, you know, I, I, I don't know, because I don't know the depth of that conversation, but if the understanding is like, oh, they want bricks and mortars, rape crisis centers, versus, oh, let's figure out a way to really mobilize around getting consent-based sex ed into every elementary school in America, Right, I think it's maybe just like a shift in understanding. You don't just need the, because because eighteen year old girls don't go to the rape crisis center. They're on my app talking to each other. Right, so where is the support needed? Is it about you know different tech innovations? Is it about supporting media and supporting campaigns to do more innovative educational work? I found when when we were trying to you know, do stuff with Circle of Six, which won a prize from the White House, and we have hundreds of thousands of users, that. We had two problems, like federal, like CDC, they want seven year studies of technology. I was like, in seven years, this app's gonna beam through my tooth. Like, it's just like, tech changes so quickly, right? So this understanding like, oh, it's only gonna work if we can study it for these epically long periods of time. Like we're in a, a much faster period of time. So I think a study period that's shorter um, or with interval check-ins, I think more support for community-based, community-driven, participatory stuff. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk more about it with you offline. Elizabeth, did you want to add anything? I mean, wh what I came away from uh, working on this story is that a lot of the problems that we uh, tend to identify with democracy at the highest levels are also problematic <laughs> all the way down. And so there were a lot of people involved in Amber's case who were elected officials. I mean, the district attorneys, et cetera, who um, should have been held accountable by the people of the city. Um, and there just wasn't a lot of transparency. A lot of people didn't know there was even an issue. They didn't realize Tarrant County had a 50% non-indictment rate on acquaintance rapes, um, which, I mean, compare that to Austin, which I think at the same time had a 13% non-indictment rate. Um, so there was something going on that the people of the city didn't know about and, and therefore couldn't hold their elected officials accountable for. Um, and so, I mean, if I were working in philanthropy, um, that's something that I would focus on, is there is a, there's a piece of this puzzle that has to do with um, you know, sort of local uh, transparency and democratic control um, that, that is, is being obstructed. We have time for one more question. Oh, two then, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, uh, she had her hand up first, and then I'll come back to you. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, I, I, I read your article. I know you're an a, opinion columnist. I wanted to ask, maybe this is not a question, but why, why is your piece considered a piece? Basically because I'm in the op-ed section. 
uh, I used to be in the newsroom. I was an editor, and I, I had the story then. I pitched it then, and they were just busy. They, they were busy with Trump stuff. Um, Who? <laughs> the, Who? The, the newsroom. Um, and I, I understand that they've got they've got they've got they've got their obligations to readers to keep them informed about politics and so on. And this was an, a story from 2006, so it wasn't going anywhere. Um, but I, I eventually got my job in op eds. And the first thing I said is, hey, I have this piece. I mean, it took three years to, to do, and I was like, I want to publish it. I, I, it's going to be here somewhere else. And um, I mean, I think I, I owe it to the everyone I interviewed and all the work that I had to do uh, to, to actually get it published. And so uh, another thing that publishing it under opinions allowed me to do was to kind of uh, analyze the information we had a little bit more rather than just a straight reporting story. So that's why there's a big meditation in the middle on Montaigne and Wordsworth and easy prey. Um, and, I, and I was glad I was able to do that ultimately uh, to the degree that I don't think I would want to do a story like this in just a straight reported fashion. Certainly a place in the order of things for thing like that. But just for me as a writer, I actually really appreciate the opportunity to analyze and opine on what I was seeing in the, in the data that we had. But, but opinion makes it sound subjective or... I yeah, and there's been a lot of confusion about that. We did an FAQ after the, um, after the story came out because we had a lot of questions from readers saying, why is this under the opinion section? Um, and it basically just has to do with... It. It's not the case that we, public, you know, we ha have every story that's going to go in the paper and then we read them all and decide where they fit. All right, so it's not like... Uh, that's just not how things are slotted. Papers are sort of medieval. They're organized into lots of little fiefdoms. And the opinion section, op-eds, is the kingdom of Fred Hyatt. And uh, those are all his people. We're all stable together. We work together. We do investigative journalism that's fact-checked by the same people who fact-check the newsroom stories. Uh, so it's just as rigorous in terms of its investigative quality. It just ends up published under that heading because uh, that's where I am. I'm, st I'm stable there. And... Um, uh, in the in the paper, when they published it in print, they gave it its own section. It came out double A. So you had the A section and then its own independent section. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Final question goes to you. Yeah, I'm, uh, piggybacking on that, I wanted to ask you about form. And, and Nancy s shared a bit about her process, talked about spreadsheets and their relationship to documentary. Um, I'm interested in um, building on this previous discussion about the opinion as a context for this piece, the special section for, for your uh, long investigative article. What are, the what are the differences in the possibility of telling these stories between an 80-minute documentary feature film and a multi-page print special section? You know, is there something about this double exposure is asking us to consider once again the possibilities of documentary film and investigative journalism. And so I, I'd be curious to hear you both as a closing uh, observation about the possibilities of the forms in which you're working. Well, I don't want everyone to think my film is just a spreadsheet. Um, so uh, yes. Because that would yeah. make you a loser. <laughs> that would make me a loser. Um, but, uh, you know, we, it's, it's funny because filmmaker, you know, I don't have journalistic training, so I, I didn't have rigorous fact checking until much later in my process. And like, I didn't have someone being like, you have to do that. So I learned, we did it, you know, but it was sort of um, fast and loose because of the internet quality of stuff. And so I think that was a really interesting learning process for me. Um, we were able to recreate visually text messages and exchanges and play a bit with time stamp, not on facts, ABC, when I'm talking to the police officer and he's leading us through the events, but more, I was able to create, I guess, in the way that you can opine a, a feeling, right? An atmosphere, that's nighttime driving, that's text messages floating in the night between, those are real exchanges. Did they happen on that road? Did they happen with that music playing? No, well, I put them there. You know, I, I want to do filmmaking because I, I want to build a context. I want you to feel it. Um, I want to play with time and, and feeling, right? But it does have to be rigorously, you know, privacy has to be protected and, and all of that stuff. So for me as an artist, that's, that's what interests me the most. But I like the boundaries of nonfiction. I, I want to die working in them, but I also find them really helpful and really useful. Um, in crafting story, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think documentary is a fantastic medium, and uh, and um, it was certainly documentaries that I had seen that I really enjoyed were certainly in my mind when I was putting this together. Um, so it's a it's a piece of writing that reflects, I think, the documentary form. In terms of procedure and how I did it, there's a giant Google folder um, that has. Um, I think 13 or 14 tiny folders inside of it, audio interviews, transcripts, notes, um, 380 pages of police files, crime scene photos, police interviews, um, so on and so forth. And so I, I meticulously organized it all. Um, and that way, as I wrote each detail, each fact, it was 9.30 on a Friday night and it was hot. Each one of those would have a footnote. Uh, and the footnote would direct the fact checker to where in my Google file they could find the a uh, place where I had pulled, for instance, I pulled from a 2006 Texas almanac what time the sun went down. Um, oh, and, God, and you really <laughs> are. You are, you are earning your title. Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then went back into, into Lexus and pulled out weather reports for the week, for the day, wow. um, and for what sports were on, what TV was, was getting high ratings, and, and sort of recreated the time period very, very carefully. Um, and I think there is a documentary quality um, to that, and I was certainly going for the emotional immediacy and, and mood creation that you get out of a really good documentary like Roll Red Roll. Um, and, and so, I mean, I'm really excited about the intersection actually between investigative journalism and documentary. I think they have a, quite a bit in common and a lot to share. Yeah, I love that you did that with the sunrise and set, because we did that with um, 2012 font, 2012 look, 2012 hacker, 2012 sound, you know, Twitter changed its interface. Like me and my producer Steven are like obsessed with weird internet archive and you know, that, that making sure, because when adults do, kids do social media, it's always like a mess. It's like very clear the adult thought this is how the kid uses technology. Um, and it's always just off. So he and I were really committed to like, no, this is the sound that the key makes. This is like the look of the font. This is like how Twitter was representing X, Y, and Z at this time. And it can't be the updated version. So really Really being true to 2012, really being true to that time is so fun to me. Yeah. Thank you guys. I want to thank you so much. You guys um, are amazing. Your work is amazing. And thank you. And thanks to you guys for indulging us and engaging um, our guests this morning. Thank